For the past few weeks, we've been attending school with our teacher, Mr. James. James was the brother of Jesus and the pastor of the Jerusalem church. He had barely started teaching his congregation how to follow Christ when his whole congregation was dispersed to other cities and other nations. Without the apostles and James close by, things quickly began to go sideways. People began to get into false teachings and listening to things. I mean, they had a desire to learn. They just didn't know the truth of the word. So James tried his best to teach his congregation through letters. The book of James is one of those letters that he wrote to his congregation. The church that James is writing to sounds a lot like the church today. He addresses situations that we still struggle with. The main theme of the book in James is wisdom. He talks about two different kinds of wisdom. We all get to choose what wisdom we're going to listen to. But the only way to truly have the abundant life that Jesus came to give is to accept the wisdom that comes from God. The passage we looked at last week started with a rhetorical question. He said, who is wise and understanding among you? We would all like to consider ourselves wise, but James explains that the truly wise people are those who actually do the right thing. We can know what it is to do right, but if we don't actually do that, all we have is knowledge. James says that knowledge without action is not wisdom. Today, we are looking at the first part of James chapter 4. We talked about it briefly last week, but we're going to look at it in more detail today. Once again, James starts with a question. In verse 1, he says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. Now think about that for a moment. Think about the arguments that you have been involved in or the arguments that you have seen. I'm not sure who it was, but someone once told me you can't have a one-sided argument. All arguments are caused because of differing opinions, and neither party is willing to give in to the other party, so they fight. We fight to get what we want at the expense of what the other person wants. We fight to get what we want, even if we know we're in the wrong, or even if getting our way will hurt someone else, because we bought into the world's wisdom that teaches, I'm the only one that matters, and truth is relative. So if I believe it, it's true, at least for me. We talked about that last week. Society as a whole no longer believes in absolute truth. Truth is whatever I want it to be. I have the right to fight for what I believe. Unfortunately, arguing and fighting seldom accomplish anything. And in the rare cases that we do get our own way, somebody else usually gets hurt in the process. This is true in all of our relationships, but James is specifically addressing relationships within the church. Now, I get the impression there was a lot of fighting going on between the members of James's congregation. We aren't told what those fights were, but maybe they were similar to some of the fights that we have in churches today. What style of music is appropriate? What instruments should be used in worship? What should we wear when we go to church? Should we sit on chairs or pews? Should the lights be on or off? Should the pastor stand behind a pulpit or a table or have nothing at all? The funny thing about most of the things that churches fight about is that very few of them are even addressed in the Bible. We fight over preferences and opinions. None of them have any merit when it comes to things that really matter or fulfilling the job that Jesus gave us to do. James says that our arguments come for, from our own desires. In other words, what controls your heart controls your behavior. Is your heart controlled by you and your desires? Or is your heart controlled by God? Jesus said, no man can serve two masters. It's always going to be one or the other. Whatever rules your heart controls your life and your behavior. It's easy to blame others for our problems. It's his fault. It's her fault. It's their fault. We think that if we can change the other person's attitude or behavior, the issue will be resolved. Unfortunately, 
none of us have the ability to change anyone else. The only person we have control over is ourselves. Now, that's not to say that someone can't change. People can change. But the only way they change is through the power of God. It's not our eloquent speech or our powerful words. James has already addressed our speech. He says we should only speak when God asks us to speak. But even then, it isn't our words that bring the change. It's the power of God that's behind those words because we're speaking God's words that brings the change. Paul acknowledged that, in fact, in his letter to the Corinthian church. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5, Paul said, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom, as I proclaim to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. The root of all conflict is the issue of control. If I can't control my world, I get angry, and I enter into conflict with another person. The issue is not us controlling the other person. The issue is God controlling our heart. Notice that James uses a war metaphor. He says that conflict arises from desires that battle within us. Paul said that our battles are not against people. It's against spiritual forces of darkness. Of course, we like to think that those spiritual forces of darkness are in everybody else. When the truth is... Actually, the battle is with demons that dwell within us. Whatever controls your heart influences your life and your behavior. That's a thought that's echoed throughout Scripture. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 17 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not able to do whatever you want. James says that all fights are caused by our desires. The word desire in this passage comes from the Greek word hedonon, from which we get hedonist. A hedonist is a person whose sole desire in life is to satisfy themselves. A hedonist is a person that lives for pleasure. A person who is driven by his or her passions. A desire for pleasure. My pleasure, my happiness is the most important thing. At the core of hedonists' worldview is me. Anything that contributes to what I want is embraced. A hedonist is really a slave to their own desires. James is describing here any desire that is contrary to the will or the commands of God. Let's look at some of the other strong words that James uses in this passage. He uses words like battle, quarrel, kill, fight. Now, I doubt that anyone in the church was actually killing someone else in the physical sense. And I doubt that there were actually any fist fights going on in the church. Although I have heard of one case that's supposed to be a true case where a pastor and a deacon got into an argument after a morning service. And it escalated to the point where they actually exchanged punches and the fight ended when the pastor was knocked unconscious. Although in the world, fights or disagreements do sometimes lead to murder. Since James is addressing the church here, I think he was probably referring to words or attitudes towards others that are ungodly in nature and actually wishing harm upon somebody. I would never harm you myself, but I am hoping that God punishes you. I am hoping that God teaches you a lesson. I am hoping that you will learn through something that puts you in your place. Jesus said that if we call someone a fool, We have murdered them 
already in our hearts. And James has already addressed words earlier in his passage, and he addresses words again at the end of chapter 4. We need to be careful what we say, because regardless of what the saying says, words do hurt. Words can kill. James says that the result of selfishness always leads to conflict. And then he describes three different conflicts that come out of selfishness. The first conflict is conflict with others. The first consequence we've already noted is conflict with other people. Did you note that fights and quarrels are plural? In chapter 3, James just finished describing the qualities that should mark our lives. He says our lives should be marked by pure, peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere, peacemakers. But instead, our lives are dominated by fights, quarrels, battles, and coveting. So the first conflict we have is with other people. The second conflict that comes from our evil desires is a conflict within ourselves. And sometimes that's why we have conflicts with other people, because we're actually having an inner conflict. Paul describes that inner conflict, that inner war, in Romans chapter 7, verses 15 to 25. He says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but I do what I hate. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it. But it is sin living in me. Now, this is the Apostle Paul, one of the greatest evangelists that ever lived. And he said, I've got sin living in my life that influences me. Verse 18, for I know that the good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, that I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. Paul acknowledges that his heart is not completely under the control of the Holy Spirit. He still has a lot of self. He still has selfish desires that keep trying to take over. And sometimes he is guilty of allowing those selfish desires to dominate and not allowing the Holy Spirit to dominate. Let's continue on, starting with verse 21. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ, our Lord. If the Apostle Paul struggled with this, then who are we to think that we wouldn't struggle with it? We all have selfish desires. It's part of being human. It's not a sin to have selfish desires. It's when those desires begin to control us and we give in to those desires that they become sin. James already talked about that earlier in his letter. In James chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, we read this, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. Even Jesus had selfish desires. In Hebrews 4.15, we read this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Jesus 
being human, the human side of him had selfish desires because that is part of being human. And those selfish desires turn into temptations. And when we listen to those temptations and then start acting upon those, that's when it can, turns into sin. Jesus had those desires, but he kept them in check. He said, I will not let those desires control me. I will let the Holy Spirit control my life. One of the great examples of a selfish desire that Jesus had was just before his crucifixion. His flesh was selfish. He didn't want to die the awful death that he knew he was about to endure. Who of us would? He prayed to his Father in heaven, and he admitted that he selfishly didn't want to go through with it. But then he nipped that desire in the bud, and he said, even though I don't want to do this, Father, even though my selfish desire wants to get out of this, not my will, Father, but yours be done. Jesus was able to crucify his selfish desires and give in to the will of his Father and to what was best for us. Instead of thinking about what was best for him, he thought about what's best for the world, what's best for everyone else. And we talked about that last week. The Bible tells us, don't think about yourself. Instead, think about everyone else. What is good for them? Our selfish desires cause conflict with others and conflict within ourselves, but they also cause conflict with God. James chapter 4, verse 4 says, You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. It sounds almost like James changed subjects here. He goes from discussing the war we're having with other people in our lives to talking about adulterous people, but no, it's one continuous thought. We need to understand it the way that his audience understood it. Remember, James is speaking in a Jewish context. When his congregation heard the term adultery, they would have immediately recognized what he meant. They would remember Hosea chapter 1, verse 2, where Israel is designated as an unfaithful wife of God. Israel had been called to be the covenant bride of God, the wife of God. When Israel went chasing after other gods, when it began to look to the world and give in to the human ways of thinking, they became an adulteress. And because James is writing to the Jews, this term is something they understood. Adultery is the sin of giving the love I have promised exclusively to one person to someone else. I become a spiritual adulterer when I give the reign of my heart to someone or something other than God. And often it's not really someone else, it's ourselves. We give the control to ourselves, to our own desires. When we do that, giving into our desires instead of into God's will, we have committed adultery against the God that we claim to love. When something or someone other than God is ruling my heart, I have gone outside of the promise that I made to God. In effect, I'm saying, God, my relationship with you isn't enough. I want to be satisfied, and you're not fully satisfying my desires, so I'm going to fulfill those things somewhere else. God calls it spiritual adultery. Our problem is we want God, but we also want other things. We want what our physical, what our flesh what our human nature wants. We can't have it both ways. James says when we have conflict, we always look outward for the answer. We think the conflict will go away if we can change that situation, if we can change that person. But God says, no, that conflict will not be resolved until you put me back in my rightful place until you start loving me with your whole heart and doing everything the way I have 
commanded. Stop looking at yourself through the worldly lens and look at yourself through my lens. God doesn't want just part of our heart. He wants all of it. God doesn't want just partial obedience. He wants full surrender. Verse 5 says that God longs for the spirit that He has put within us. He wants to have uninterrupted fellowship with us through the Holy Spirit that He has given us. But too often, we quench His Spirit and allow the other spirit, our own spirit, our own nature, our selfishness to take over. Now, I want to quickly read through the next few verses because there are other things that we need to talk about today. So please bear with me as I rush through this. In the next few verses, James is going to tell us how to solve the problem. Now, remember, he's talking to believers. These are people that want to follow Christ, but they've been giving in to selfishness. Starting with verse 7, he says, this is the answer. This will solve your conflicts. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Now, last week he talked about our selfish desires. And he, he said that's demonic, so that's the devil. Our selfish desires, even though they come from us, they're actually put there by the devil. We need to resist those selfish desires. We need to resist the devil. Resist the devil, he will flee from you. Come near to me, or come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter, because the reason we go after our selfish desires is we want to be happy. We want to please ourselves. But he says, forget about that. Sometimes you need to weep in order to really be in tune with God. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and He will lift you up. You're not going to get to where you want to be by doing it your way. Humble yourselves. Submit yourselves. Let God lift you up. So these are the things he says there in those passages. Submit yourselves to God 100%. Not part. 100. Resist the devil. Remember, selfishness is not a God. That's part of the devil. So resist the devil when those selfish desires come in. Come near to God. The more time we spend with God, the more like Him we will become. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Grieve, mourn, and wail over your current situation. Admit that you are wrong. Don't put the blame on somebody else. Don't start a fight with somebody else and argue with somebody else. Instead, look inward. Find out where you are in error and repent of your own actions. Humble yourselves before God. In other words, stop trying to do it your way. Let God be in charge of your life by doing what He says in His Word. In verses 11 and 12, James sums up this portion by essentially taking us back to what he already said about examining ourselves in the light of God's Word. He says, stop judging other people. Stop blaming everything on others and blaming your problems on them. Stop trying to change them. Instead, examine yourself. Allow God to change what needs to be changed in your own life. We love to look at what everyone else is or is not doing. Pointing out their faults or puffing ourselves up because we're better than they are. Sometimes we even justify our own selfish desires by saying, well, yeah, my selfish desires aren't as bad as theirs, so I'm okay. The only person we should be comparing ourselves to is Jesus Christ. How do we measure up compared to Him? How do our lives and our decisions measure up according to what He has said? Not what everybody else is doing, but what He has said. Submit to God. 